All right, let's go to the Q&A session. And we have Barbara Ann Harmer from ISD One Tray Innovative Sterilization Technologies. Barbara, thank Barbara Ann, thank you for joining us. Hi, Justin. Good evening. Thanks for having us. Yeah, this was a great episode, and I'm just going to kick it off with the question that I got in the first section, which I wasn't expecting about uh, how was it filming and were you nervous? You look cool as a cucumber uh, in your spots on that episode. So were you nervous or were you just taking it all in stride? Oh, I think there's always a little bit of nervousness, but I think when you believe in what you're talking about, I don't think it, you can be as nervous as you might think. Well, uh, now we're going to throw some questions at you, and uh, these are good ones, and I think you're ready for them. I'm going to expect that you've probably heard a few of these before, and it's always good to it's always good to answer these. But here's the first one: Do you think that one tray enables hospitals to avoid addressing broken processes? and poor quantities of critical instrumentation. So then they kind of summarize it. Is it a Band-Aid solution rather than a root cause fix? Well, I can share with you as a clinician for all these years, um, there are enough broken promises and certainly poor quantities of critical instrumentation in a hospital. However, I think it is a root cause fix because what it does is it helps hospitals and other surgical facilities understand the importance of having adequate instrumentation that can be turned around and used as quick as they might need it, showing that there is an efficiency, there's an effectiveness, and there's an economical advantage to using our technology. I think that um, this root cause fix is something I know that I have certainly spoken about much of my nursing career, and that is our product is able to provide one standard of care to each and every patient. So I think that it is definitely a root cause fix. Uh, it is not a Band-Aid solution. It, in fact, enables an organization to provide patient safety and provide sterilized equipment in a very fast, economical way the next question and barbara ann you have heard this one for sure and i think it came out right in the middle of the episode as well but they said isn't the one tray only indicated for iuss and i'm just going to go ahead and define that for the audience that's immediate use steam sterilization and so there's a big push in the industry to keep the frequency of IUSS down. So, Barbara Ann, uh, tell us, is the one tray only indicated for IUSS? Well, um, the uh, clearance for uh, one tray was completed in 2006, much prior to the even the birth of the term IUSS. Uh, the words immediate use is in the 510K, but this is um, a product that has storage. And that is the key feature, is with storage, the organization can decide um, how, in fact, they want to use it. But the one thing that's very important that individuals need to understand is that you just can't use a tray and call it IUSS. It is tested and cleared by the FDA for IUSS or in the old days, flash. And so we are not IUSS, we have storage. And as um, all of our industry uh, terminology and books can, can show you today, is that if you have storage, you are not considered to be IUSS. <laughs> Bob's got nothing. <laughs> You're obviously doing a great job explaining it. Bob, let me ask you something just to, to key in off of that. When you talk about IUSS, when you were managing the departments, what were the IUSS rates at that time? 
what was common? Uh, gosh, initially, um, when, when I first started managing, they were fa fairly high. But like most facilities, we were striving to reduce those numbers as best we could and not use anything in the IUSS. Um, I never personally got to where we used nothing in IUSS, uh, but we dropped it down below 3%. In, in our facility, which which made everyone very happy. And, and we also annotated it um, in the record if we did have to IUSS. But um, Barbara brings up a good point. I, I think uh, one of the one of my takeaways from the visit there was um, learning that science that they're all talking about and and they went through testing just like everyone else and it they, they were approved uh, to release their product to market. So um, I, I think it's, it answers a really big question there. All right. So here's another question and this really keys in on Barbara and one of your, um, key themes in the episode, which is about moisture. And you were saying that the moisture is coming from the steam. They're asking what if moisture is already present, i.e. not from the sterilizer, hypothetically, moisture from decontam is left in a lumen device, then leaks out during the sterilization process. Is that possibility accounted for in the validation? You know, with liquid, wa liquid water is much more resistant to steam penetration. This actually is a new question. This is not one that someone has asked before. However, let me try it this way. One tray is not a magical box. One tray is involved in sterilization. One tray or your organization should have decontamination and cleaning processes and policies in place. If you are a follower of Amy ST79, you will know that Amy ST79 states that all instruments are supposed to be dry before you package them. One tray does nothing differently. We don't want to be treated differently. Your instruments should be dry when they are packaged into a one tray prior to sterilization. The um, lumens can, in fact, have water in it after the sterilization process, but it's very key to make sure that the understanding is, is that water is being created in the tray during the sterilization cycle. It is not coming through the filter from an outside source and therefore contaminating possibly the instruments that are contained in that tray. So the answer to the question is instruments should be dry before you put them in a one tray, but instruments, once they are sealed in an operating container that doesn't have any issues and it has been um, filtered properly and locked down properly, everything that is contained in that tray is just as sterile as the water on your shelf in a bottle that was commercially capped and contained. Yeah, Barbara, you bring up a really good point. I, I would also throw out there with that very same lumened instrument, if it was placed into a peel pouch or if it was placed into a wrap set or another container, the, the same question could be asked. What if that water comes out of that lumen device? Then are, we're, we're talking about every modality potentially being contaminated. Yes, Bob, I totally agree. Can you talk a little bit more? Dave brought this up during the episode as well, where and you just alluded to it, but just kind of off the side, but about holding everybody to the same standard. What does that mean to you, Barbara Ann? Well, it is interesting. Um, again, we do not claim anything that we have not proven scientifically. So the way that I would answer that question is our packaging system go through the entire same process of clearance as any other packaging system. And when we talk about packaging systems, we're not talking about just rigid containers. We're talking about wrap. We're talking about peel packs and, and packaging in that respect. So we did not go through a process differently. The only thing was with our particular product, we were able to prove scientifically that we could, because of the science, the design, the technology, the filtering, the um, sealed container, 100% sealed container. Because of that work, 
we could provide a product that could sterilize the items to tend to the negative six sterility assurance level, which in big terms is microbial lethality, otherwise known as we're killing the microorganisms and killing the bugs. The, the problem is that we have individuals that because we have retained moisture, they kind of correlate that because we have water, we're IUSF. The fact in point is that an IUSF cycle, as well as a, in quotes, terminal cycle, of which there really is nothing that really relates to that. You either have storage or you don't. But because people talk like that, I'll explain it this way. They both have to achieve 10 to the negative 6 sterility assurance level. And so there really is no difference when it comes to the sterilization. It's the processing and it's the way, in fact, that it has been um, believed and understood in the past. And this is what is so, as you all talk, disruptive in, in, the, in the world today where one tray is seen and recognized. All right, let's go to the next question. This one is, instruments can rust with extended exposure to water. Is that an issue that customers face? We actually did address this um, in the, in the um, documentary that we just watched. And that is that um, people do have pre preconceived notions when we say retained moisture is normal in the tray that they visualize instruments just sitting in a container of water. That, in fact, is usually not the case. Between the bottom of the tray where the filters are, are, are placed, there is what we call a deck plate. And the instruments sit on top of that deck plate. And sitting on top of that deck plate, they are not sitting in the water. It is possible, though, that water could be above the deck plate, but again, in an appropriately contained um, tray and where it has met all the parameters that we set forth in our IFU, that water above the deck plate is perfectly fine. The instruments are still considered sterile. But where rust is concerned, that would be ever so aware of the case because as, as I've already mentioned, in fact, the water actually, the bonds break down again and the water turns back into a gaseous state and escapes through the filtering system as a vapor. vapor. And we, again, scientifically, with the facts, have been able to prove that all of the water, the retained moisture that has been left in the tray, um, that was manufactured in the tray, is gone in five days or less. So I hope that answered that question for you. So here's another one. And... I think this kind of shouts back to the question we asked before, but it's very specific. Uh, does IUSS and terminal sterilization methods have to achieve the same sterility assurance level? They do. Again, a misconception in the industry is that there's something different that's going on with IUSS. IUSS, as well as a terminal sterilization cycle, a packaging system that has storage, IUSS, one that does not have storage, both have to achieve 10 to the negative 6 SAL, which stands for the sterility assurance level. So they have to be able to, we have to be able to prove in both processes that in fact microorganisms have been killed off or that microbial lethality has been achieved? Great question. All right, we have one for Bob. So, Bob, I wasn't expecting to have to answer questions in the first go around. Now <laughs> you've got one. <laughs> right? What's your take? What's your biggest takeaway from the visit to uh, IST? Um, I, I kind of alluded to it earlier, but um, it, it's the science behind the product. And, and if I'm being transparent, in the beginning, based on my background and growing up in the OR and being there a very long time ago, uh, I had that same issue with moisture in the set. Um, but being on site and hearing the science and seeing the science behind the product and knowing that it went through a very rigorous testing process and was ultimately approved to be released to the market, um, it, it 
answered questions for me that I, I carried for a very long time. All right, I think we have one more, and I'll just let everybody know in the audience, you can still submit another question. We do have a little bit more time here. Uh, since IUS, it's a follow-up on the last one, since immediate use steam sterilization and terminal sterilization achieve the same sterility assurance level, is the only real difference storage? You know, I love to give this answer because it doesn't really evoke a long conversation. The difference between an IUSS product and one that is terminal by industry definition is a one-word answer. And yep, you've guessed it, that one word is storage. Storage is the difference. In IUSS, a container that has been cleared for IUSS, has no storage, one that is able to be called terminal by our industry definition has storage, and one tray has storage. Okay, Barbara Ann, I think that's it for the questions. I just want to thank you. I know you got most of these questions in the past, but I'm glad to hear that somebody threw you a curveball and uh, you had a great answer. Oh. Nope, there's one more question in here. They squeezed one in at the deadline. Here we go. Uh, Barbara Ann, can you speak about your face mask project in providing your filters to hospitals during the pandemic? And I do remember seeing this uh, quite a bit on LinkedIn and social media. Well, I can tell you as an ISP employee, um, there's lots of things to be very proud of. But this was a very proud moment when the uh, owner of the company, uh, along with our uh, administrative team, made the decision to provide a half a million filters to anyone that needed them that was providing um, care to our patients in the United States at no charge. We provided the filters as well as the rubber bands to be able to make the mask, and they were all uh, delivered. Um, what I was extremely so proud about because it is what our product is based on is our filtering material uh, provides not only a particulate barrier, but also a fluid barrier. So as an alternative to what is marketed in this company as a surgical mask, our filters provide an excellent barrier for what was needed in an emergent situation. So um, kudos to our administrative team who allowed this to happen and helped um, our first, our first line providers. We have another question that popped up. It says, so if your instructions for use do not require a dry time, that's one thing, but what if your instrument manufacturer, and I guess this is speaking from the frontline technician's viewpoint, there's two different instructions for use, the instructions for use for the one tray system doesn't require a dry time, but what if the instrument manufacturer's IFU or instructions for use does require a dry time or indicate a dry time? Where the dry time is concerned, um, where um, we don't require a dry time, I think the first important fun fact to know though and to understand is that dry time has nothing to do with sterilization. Dry time is sterility maintenance. And so when you have the three-legged stool of the sterilizer, the medical device, and the packaging system, the sterilizer is going to give you their IFU. The medical device is going to give you their IFU, which is going to include the time and the temperature. Hang with me for a second. I'll get back to the dry time that's located in that IFU. But actually, the dry time and the storage and the, in quotes, shelf life, either which way that you refer to it, comes from the packaging system. And because our tray was cleared with zero dry time, then you would not need to honor, let's say, the dry time that was indicated in the medical device. But let me go one step further. When medical devices go to be cleared, they are presented to the FDA in a packaging system. The FDA does not require that medical device 
to come through their testing in multiple packaging systems. In other words, in a rigid container, in a peel pack, and or in a, a, wrapped, a wrapped rigid container or peel pack. That is the choice of the medical device company. And so when you see the dry time in a medical device ISU, that is coming from what that medical device used in testing, but in no way does that limit an item from being placed in a different packaging container. And so what has historically been used is the um, philosophy of uh, and the technique of user verification. Validation is done by manufacturers. Verification is done by um, users. And so when you perform product families and you take trays through con combining uh, three consecutive cycles in, in a department, um, replacing, of course, all of the testing materials in each uh, load that you place that tray in, you can then prove that you are able to achieve the sterility parameters that were so called for by the manufacturer. So if you take a one tray and you place something that had a four minute, 270, 20 minute dry time, and you put it into a one tray for four minutes, 270, with zero dry time or one minute if your sterilizer doesn't go below one minute, and then you take your testing materials out and you do three of those runs and you can prove that all of your testing materials changed, then you have verified that the sterility parameters can be achieved. That's why Amy created what is called user verification. Does that help? That makes perfect sense. And I think it's a great thing to just kind of add because we hear it all the time in the industry, the confusion between validation and verification. Bob, I don't know if you want to chime in on that. Muted. Uh, yeah, something that you hear all of the time, Justin, uh, people will continually say, hey, we validated that in our process, so we're good to go. And uh, there's a constant reminder that we, we can't validate. We don't have the same tools that the manufacturers and the validation testing labs have. We don't have uh, thermal coupling devices and data loggers that are placed in the set to measure temperature at various spots or locations within the container. So uh, it's a great reminder that we can only verify in a hospital. Uh, one more question here. What if a surveyor tells me I am using one tray as an immediate use steam sterilization or only for IUSS, Barbara Ann? Well, if you're using a one tray and you're labeling it and calling it IUSS, you are using it off-label. Um, we uh, have never gone through testing and been cleared because we have storage. And so, as we've discussed, you can't have storage in BIUSS. That's an oxymoronish, um, you know, situation. So, so if you're labeling it as IUSS, there's a knowledge deficit somewhere that we would love to have the opportunity to correct that because you shouldn't be doing that. Um, and so, um, if a surveyor says you are using it and documenting as IUSS and cites you for that, then that would be an apt citation. That would be a citation that would be done in the right. However, if the surveyor turning the tables, if the surveyor says you're, you can only use this as IUSS, then again, in my own facility, what I would make sure that I have is I would be able to prove to the surveyor, not only be able to recite, because the verbal explanation is always uh, customary, but I would be able to prove with documentation that I had been able to verify, as we just discussed, the trays or some of the trays that we would be using so that they could recognize that, in fact, I did meet the sterility parameters. And so um, teaching and educating all is not a bad thing. And surveyors do not necessarily know everything that they're surveying. And so, you know, with mutual respect and admiration and, again, the point of surveying is to make an organization better, not to browbeat someone. I think it's very important that it can be certainly a sharing of information 
uh, on both sides of the table where there would be an achievement of a positive outcome, especially for safe patient care. Mm-hmm. You know, Barbara, so Ann, you bring up a really We've good had point. Some of our... oh, go ahead, Bob. I was just going to say that Barbara Ann's bringing up a very good point. Um, it's okay to educate the surveyors, and it's okay to show them documentation or proof or um, anything that you can to show that you're doing things appropriate appropriately, whether it's policies and procedures and things like that. But the key is the mutual respect. Uh, you want to you talk to them and not argue with them. And I, I think they will understand and they will certainly listen to you. Um, I'm going to add that Barbara Ann was on uh, a podcast talking about preparing for the survey. And some of our most popular podcasts have been on that topic. Barbara Ann, one more question before we wrap it up. And it's this one's a good one. Are... Well, it says, are they, but they're obviously meaning the one tray. Uh, I'll rephrase it. Is the one tray only used in pre post vacuum sterilizers? So one tray was clear to be used in a pre vacuum sterilizer, um, but it also can be used in um, steam pulse. Um, we also um, originally, uh, I should say not originally, but in the 510K, we also provided some gravity uh, cycle usages for one tray. Uh, rarely used, but there are items in the industry yet that are not able to be pre vac And so there is a gravity, um, there's gravity information in our IFU that you could certainly use if you ran into that circumstance. But it is pre vac uh, The size of the trays would not allow it to be used in a tabletop sterilizer. It is not able to be used in any other kind of sterilizer also. Uh, And again, tabletop sterilizers work on a different premise. Uh, They work on vacuum assisted as opposed to um, as opposed to a pre-vac cycle. So they're different. Um, But the size of our trade would would discount that to begin with. So there's no confusion. So the answer to your question is yes, it is running a pre-vac cycle. And yes, it can be run in a gravity cycle following uh, the instructions that we have in our IFU. All right, Barbara Ann, great job tonight. Uh, Thank you so much for participating in the filming of Beyond the Tour and sharing um, your experience as a surveyor with everyone. And I will just encourage uh, folks to go and uh, listen to your episode on the Beyond Clean podcast. Thank you again and have a great night.